Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. fancy title for the Save a Food Bank uh, that's, uh, well, two of them actually. Uh, it's an initiative of six uh, serving uh, Canada Association. Uh, check them out online, sa- saveafoodbank.com. Calvier's an interesting guy, a lot of passion, a lot of intention, a lot of focus, it seems to me. And and we talk, he's a consultant as well, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But, but we're going to talk, I guess, about um, generosity. I think we're going to talk about, um, uh, you know, others and what it means to uh, dig a little deeper in your community and to give back, what what it means to uh, start something and to see it through and to create the... The, the mechanism and to bring the right people together to to make something as uh, beneficial as a food bank like this happen in the greater Toronto area. It's about food, it's about nutrition, it's about hunger, it's about trust, it's about food insecurity, it's about advocacy and, and uh, um, you know, what Culver will talk about being a common bond and thread that connects us all. We also talk about Tim Ferriss and the four-hour work week. We get into a lot of stuff. This is one of my favorite interviews I've done in, in quite some time. I think you're going to enjoy it. Culver Gill, the Save a Food Bank, uh, in Mississauga, uh, one in Malton, saveafoodbank.com. Don't forget to check out my website, davidpecklive.com, for more interviews there and uh, information about my writing and my public speaking as well. Culver Gill coming soon to a theater near you. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We are joined by another very special guest here today. Culver Gill is with us. He's a consultant, and he uh, we're, at, we're actually sitting at the Save a Food Bank here in Mississauga, one of two locations. Yeah. I've just had a quick tour. Uh, Culver, thank you for joining us today. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for having me on. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, so we're going to talk. So you're a consultant. You're. Uh, are you an engineer? No, I have a biology degree, biology degree. and okay. I spent a bunch of time in mining, okay. and now I help run a food bank. So, <laughs> Okay. Hey, interesting. Uh, let's so, try to connect the dots uh, there. Oh, well, you, no <laughs> kidding. That could be. Maybe we just discovered a new topic: <laughs> mining and food banks. Where, where's the connection? Because typically, when I think of you know big mining, mm-hmm. I don't think about things like poverty uh, and uh, you know the gender gap in international development, unless I'm thinking about it in a critical way. In a critical way. Right? But if you look over the course of history, uh, uh, mining, uh, while well, there's many flaws in it, has actually been one of the biggest tools for uh, economic. Uh, enrichment of a, of a community. Uh, yes, there's a resource curse, but in many, uh, most of Western society has been built on the back of natural resources. So uh, that trend is going to continue, but we got to figure out a way of doing it right. Absolutely. Yeah. So I saw you at a community event recently. Uh, you, you spoke, and I just got this sense, uh, you spoke for a few minutes, and I just got the sense from you from the stage that uh, it was at the ROM and that you, you had a very uh, inclusive edge, that you were open to others, that you were willing to share, that mm-hmm. you were... You had a, there was a generosity of spirit there. And then, of course, I find out a little bit later that you're the executive director of the Save a Food Bank and uh, basically giving back to your community. So so the, I guess the intuition was right on some level. Well, that was my um, best material. It's downhill from here. So. Yes, you had me in stitches. <laughs> there you yeah. Go. yeah. So, so, I mean, A, I guess, is that true? I, I think I get that sense. But tell me more about why you're here at a food bank. Uh, it, to me, it does seem like a bit of a stretch for a mining consultant to, to directing food banks. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm filling in uh, uh, on a volunteer basis right now because this is a organization that uh, we founded uh, uh, about five years ago. And, and there's a group of us, uh, all second generation sick Canadians here, all either you know, born here or grew up here, my wife included, and some dear friends that we've kind of known for years. And uh, all of us have done very well in our careers. This country has given us so much uh, public education public health care. Our families have thrived here and we've gotten to the point where we're leading very, very comfortable, privileged lives. And, and, and that's, uh, that's a rarity. And, and so much of our values speak of social justice, Essex, and, and, and about equality and charity. And we were looking around and saying, we're kind of maybe not putting that into practice. 
and Canada has been so generous to us as a community, uh, maybe it's time to start giving back. And, and, and this place is, I call it a second generation institution, where our first generation institutions, uh, every community came here and they built their, their churches, their synagogues, their mosques, their mandars. Um, that's first generation because they're taking care of their community and, and establishing a platform. Second generation now is going to be the food banks, the pantries, the homeless shelters, the soup kitchens, all those different things where they're now putting their values into action. And uh, you know, every food, most of the food banks in Canada started out in church basements. Mm. And so uh, for a sick community to create a food bank itself, is, it's not an extension where actually it's a path well worn uh, about taking those values and put them into action. But what I'm really excited about this place is that for, for a relatively new community, even though six have been here over 100 years, uh, uh, this is probably one of the few uh, uh, physical manifestations of, of, that, of that thought where, you know, for us to tell the world how great we are, you know, we're always fighting a PR war trying to tell the world uh, trying to fight misconceptions. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I, I don't, you know, for me, it's, I don't need big billboards telling the world how, uh, what six are, what we believe, who we are. Uh, why don't we just show it? Why don't we just do it? Uh, you know, if you come to the food bank here and you have a, a group of people who, you know, generally many of us come from the sick community here, and you're treated with respect and dignity and given food for now and given access to other uh, services that are going to help you get back on your feet, uh, you don't need a pamphlet on Sikhism. <laughs> you, yeah, and you're going to see it. This is this is six serving Canada, yeah. not six serving other. No, there's six. Uh, Ninety-nine percent of our clients uh, are non-sick. Uh, Eighty percent of our volunteers are non-sick. Mm -hmm. uh, half our staff are non-sick. Uh, you know, our last executive director was 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 not sick. So for us, uh, that's actually been a real uh, point of pride, is that we've been able to, to articulate our values in a way that's universal. Uh, that uh, people from all backgrounds are able to associate with, and I think this is you know, the challenge for all faith groups: is how do you how do you uh, translate who you are so, into a way so, that others connect? So let me read one of your values. Sure. So every individual is divine. It is our inherent responsibility to look after each other in our community, so no one is left behind. So I mean, it clearly sounds like that's coming through in a variety of ways in your own life, uh, from what little I know of you. Um, and I'd love to hear how that's. Uh, you're, you're translating that into the mining communities sure. that you're working in or the resource sector. So, so, for, so for us, tell, tell yeah. me about that. I mean, it sounds very spiritual, obviously, if we're all divine, yes. uh, which I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you on that. Uh, but, but yeah, tell me more. So, so sounds for like us, a good starting yeah, point for it's a food a, bank. It is, it is. Uh, you know, and, and this is where the, the, the sick values kind of yes. come in, is that one, you know, our, our opening prayer and our, and our ethos is based around the concept of ek oankar. Uh, there's one. Uh, it's 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 often translated to there's one God, right. but that's a bit of a misnomer. I, okay. I think for us, uh, God is not a father figure in the heavens. God is not uh, the, the God on the Simpsons walking along the beach with Homer Simpson as often you right. know the long right. beard and right. And, and, right. and and the anthropomorphic. Uh, for us, uh, God is much similar to the Force of Star Wars. Right. It's it's right. it's a uh, for us creator and creation are one and the same. That divine spark, that is the essence of the universe, is also the life force within each one of us. It, is there a connection to Aboriginal communities, would you say, Indigenous? I was with an uh, uh, Aboriginal elder recently, and he mm -hmm. referred to, I would say, God uh, or the great being as a great mystery. Mm -hmm. Gitchi, Gitchi Manitou, basically. Okay. And, and I just, it's something that uh, I've been gelling with more and more of late, this idea that if whenever we talk about a God or the God or one or many, we've got this metaphor. We've got, we can only speak about God, metaphysics and metaphors. Of course, of course. Me. So deeply troubling and problematic because we've all got problems with our dads and, you know, these kinds of things. Agreed. So, so, but the idea of a great mystery, uh, and, and it, I don't know, is that a... Absolutely. Connection? We call it, uh, you know, we, so there is no name for God because if, 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 if God is everything, then it's hard to say what it isn't. And, and you can have many labels and most of the labels that we have in Sikhism and South Asian tradition actually refer to the attributes of the divine. So we say the Akal Purk is one of the names we use, which is the undying force, the undying being, the, you know, the infinite, the eternal. Or we use uh, Kartar, which means the great creator. Or we use, the one that most Sikhs will use is Vaiguru, and, and Vaiguru, Guru is the ultimate, is teacher, and vai, Va is Wow, so the ultimate teacher. So these are all attributes we have of something that's much higher. At the end of the day, uh, uh, it is the great mystery. Um, because it is beyond our comprehension. Just like, you know, our eyes are only capable of seeing certain wavelengths of light. Yes. A very small parameter, but it's sure. much beyond that. Sure. Uh, if we're going to try to, you know, it is the beauty, I think, of the human experience is that the divine and the universe is so infinite, but yet we've been granted some, some capacity to try to come to terms with appreciating it and not understanding it, but appreciating it and maybe connecting with it. And so for us, creator and creation are one and the same. 
to the point where for me to sit down and do an hour of contemplative meditation with my eyes closed and going out and serving creation or serving the environment are one and the same. So seva and simran are two words that we use in Sikhi Lodge. What's the leap from that, I don't yeah. think it's much of one, to a responsibility uh, to give back in any way we can, also one of your, your values. Absolutely. I mean, it makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, there's a, there's a French philosopher, Levinas, which my le listeners will have heard me speak of before, who's been driving a lot of my own thinking. And, and he says, you know, because of Auschwitz, Jewish philosopher, he lost most of his family, all philosophy, all religion failed in the 20th basically culminates in the 20 now what do we do and so he says we have to ground our ethic in the other in the face of the other and say well, as soon as we see your face yep. i can't kill you well and i go beyond we, that and now we build and That's, it sounds kind of well, it's based on dostoevsky actually okay right? uh, uh we are all responsible he says and i more than the rest and it sounds like you guys are kind well, of i'll go one step further there is no other in sikhism so mm. if we believe there is only one right. force there you go then okay. then then actually the delusion of the world and the source of all problems from a sick perspective is this artificial separation between me and the creator and then me and the rest of creation you know as long as the i exists between you know there's you and there's me then I need something, I'm going to have to take it from you. There's a win-lose situation there. Now, as soon as I start seeing that we're all connected to one thing, it's all the same. You know, you and I have the same atoms that we're all, we all came from the Big Bang. I and mean, whatever was there, I mean, we're just different manifestations, that waves in the ocean, whatever analogy you want to pick. All of a sudden, things start becoming a lot more arbitrary. And you start realizing that, you know, it's like me going for coffee today and saying, am I going to pay it out of my left pocket or my right pocket today? Because they're both competing with each other. No, they're not. It's the same bloody pocket. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Same thing starts going then, and that, so that you know, at concept of a food bank, you know, this is my food. That's your food. Well, that's that family. They deserve to be where they are, and I am where I am. Well, that's start, totally brilliant. You, you stuff. start with the premise that we're all in this together. We don't. We don't actually have to get there. We we are. We in are one. Together. We are one. We're together. And, and actually, yeah. the biggest delusion of humanity and the biggest delusion of the human experience is that we fail to recognize this oneness. So where many other faiths are trying to get to null trying to block out everything and in the in the uh, you know that kind of existential angst of where there's nothing left that's where nirvana is the sick perspective is actually uh, the other way we're trying to get to one we're trying to find mm. the common bond the common thread that brings that makes the good and the bad the high and the low what's the common thread that goes through everything that's what we want, we're trying to connect with so when we're serving others we're trying to find the humanity in them we're trying to find the divinity within them there your LinkedIn uh, page says you, you like to turn thoughts into action. Uh, I believe you've got uh, uh, um, some, it's, I don't know if it's your bio, but you did. Um, oh, there's one. one of those little personality tests I personality think Personality test. Uh, strength you, finder, you, you, I think you, what it was. You crave to know more. You like to turn thoughts into action. I mean, that's pretty clear to me, running a food bank. I don't know if you get more actionable in your community. Uh, is that uh, something you don't see a lot of? in others? I mean, listen, I've been working in this, the international development world, the social justice world for years. It's easy to get discouraged mm -hmm. because how come you guys are and they're not, mm -hmm. right? And you get back to that division, you get back to that separation. And, and so I want to get everybody on the same boat yep. and saying, why? I agreed. We're all in this. We are all together. Now, now what? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the one of the beauties of the food bank here is there's an immediacy that keeps coming in, right? You know, I think um, I've good, been involved yeah. with many, much of my other work has been at a board level or, or you know, uh, in, in, in kind of areas where you're really trying to shift policy. Uh, and that's where things get discouraging because policy mm. shifts are, are glacial, right? <laughs> uh, in, in terms of the impact they make. And sometimes they move very quickly, but by and large, you're really trying to reset the deck here. And, and so it's incremental movements uh, that over time are gonna add up to something huge. Uh, you know, at, at the food bank here, we're still talking about advocacy, advocacy and yeah, food sure. insecurity and the bigger issues here. But in the meantime, uh, you know, we got a bunch of people that are coming in right now that are going through a really tough time in their life uh, f for a whole variety of reasons, and they need something today. So uh, my uh, grandfather used to tell me, he goes, if you ever want to feel good about yourself, go be useful to somebody else. Mm. So that, that, that immediate impulse is here. And now, you, you know, you can... Uh, see, throw all the criticism at food banks that you're just a bandaged solution of and course. you're just yeah. you're this is just feel good and and and, and most of the time uh, you know you're giving to feel better about yourself not really to impact the other person but I think there's something more what to do you do with those criticisms I frankly I'm I've been in this long enough now I think I get angry <laughs> well I That's think the, my first I think response. the people that do that are often here and, and, and there's some, this is my cynicism coming in I've uh, I want to know I, if they've ever volunteered well food I was gonna say that before I, I you know the people uh, the donors that ask there's a there's a curve there's a bunch of 
of people that don't ask any questions yeah. and never give. Interesting. And then there's a bunch of people yeah. that the other end that ask so many questions and then still don't really give. And, and then there's a bunch of people in the middle that test, you know, trust but verify. Nice. But they yeah. try to give back. Uh, I think the same thing kind of goes for volunteers. You know, at this food bank here, uh, and we, we really call ourselves more than a food bank. And I think the food bank sector, as I've gotten to know, is really trying to be more than just the bandage solution. They're, they're teaching people how to fish, but they recognize that people are hungry today and they need a fish today. And you need both of those. You can't just say, hey, someone comes through the door and, and I'm hungry today. Well, let's sit down, let's do capacity building, let's get you network, let's get, you know, build your resilience and yeah. get you on the don't path you wanna, of self-reliance. want to start your own business? Yeah, this, let's this do all that right now. And the guy's, like, the guy's like, yeah, one day, but my kids are hungry today. Yeah. So yeah. let's address it. So we need to work on both of us. And I think the criticism of food banks of only giving out food was fair, but it's also pretty outdated now because most food banks, if you go in, uh, they're not just uh, cans of tuna and macaroni and cheese. Most of them are building kitchens, have community gardens. Uh, you know, many of them are trying to give out food that uh, is better than what you and I probably eat on a regular basis because we're you know we probably don't have the best of diets. But we're trying to really understand you know that the connection between uh, food and well-being, mental well-being, and physical health, and we're trying to help on that. What about what about this notion that that food banks basic the notion of a basic income, et cetera, sure. promotes a laziness? Hmm. What, what do you think about that? Where where do you stand on that? Is that is that a fair criticism at all? You know what I, I, th I the. Th so one of the biggest questions I get at food bank non is that uh, you know how many you know how do you check that people really need the food when they come to us? Yeah. yeah. And, and and how do you know you know there must be abuse of the system and things right. like that. And always I said about abuse, and yeah. I always go at the other way. I'm like you know what there must be and I, I bet you it's it must be 80 percent of our people are just horrible. You know, horrible people that are coming in and just stealing free food from us, and they're like, "Well, it's not eighty percent." Yeah, because I'm eighty yeah. percent. Well, I mean, you must, be, you know, it must be everybody. Well, no, no, it's not everybody. Well, there must be half. Well, it's probably not half. So, what do you really think it is? Yeah, well, yeah. maybe five, ten percent. I said, no, it's like one percent, two percent. And at the end of the day, what are they taking from us? They're taking food. Yeah. We're yeah. in a country where there's yeah. there's no lack of food in this yeah. country. Yeah. I mean, there's no shortage of food. There's no shortage of money yeah. in this country. Yeah. What there is 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 supply and demand and sure. logistics sure. and organization, and that's where we're trying to fit into it. Um, I'm not gonna because one guy's gonna come here and ask for you know maybe take more food than he needs. Maybe they don't need his, they don't need the food right now, but they're coming here. I'm not gonna make 99 people f uh, prove how poor they are. Yes. And further their stigma and humiliation of their situation, what most of which is beyond their control to just try out that one guy or one family that's maybe coming or taking right, a little bit right. more. So coming back to basic income here, I think, you know, uh, at the end of the day, there are so many disparate safety nets available to people right now, but there, there's such inefficiency in them, uh, so much administration and bureaucracy, generally speaking, I think, associated when you have multiple programs at different levels of government, that, and then also you're dealing with people who may not always have the capacity to navigate the system. So I, I, the premise of one-stop shop all comes together, simplify the process so that people who are the most vulnerable don't have to fill out 700 forms just to be able to have a roof over their head and have something to eat. Uh, th that seems very appealing. Now we gotta make sure that we that single income doesn't come in and replicate and, and add, become redundant on top of everything else. So I think the path that we're going down of being very thoughtful about it, I think is important, but at the end of the day, uh, it, you know, you're going to promote laziness. You know what? Laziness on twenty thousand bucks a year, twenty five thousand bucks. No, 30? I know yeah. it's absurd. I yeah. mean, one of the, the one of the comments I've heard recently uh, too is, you know, so doesn't that sort of, uh, you know, the notion of inheritance. Yep. So if you get an inheritance from your parents or your family or somebody, does that huge influx of cash all of a sudden promote laziness within your own community, within your own family, within your own yeah, self? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm still trying to figure out how to attend to those criticisms so, in a holistic, so, meaningful way because yeah. my, my immediate reaction is I just want to swear and break things. Yeah, agreed. So <laughs> but, Warren Buffett has a quote that I, I, I love that he's used for why he's giving away most of his inheritance. But yes. why he's giving, and he says for his, for his own children, he goes, I want to give them enough that they can do anything they want but not give them so much that they choose to do nothing. Well, look, and when is enough enough, right? Of that course. the biggie, right? Well, yeah, of and course. And it's, it's going to be different for every situation and stuff. Yeah. But I think, yeah. I think uh, uh, you know what? It has to be such that I think we need to be careful of, uh, and I've heard this from some of our, we had some great employees come through the food bank over the years, a real social justice mindset. Let me tell you, I didn't speak like this six years ago. Right. Six years ago, I was, a, I was a guy flying around the world oh, working for a fancy good. money company. And, 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 uh, and coming here has, has fundamentally changed my life. You know, we have this... There's a real vilification or criminalization of poverty going on, or mm. or this assumption that if you're if you're poor, 
you're somehow lacking integrity or honesty. Yeah. Yep. You know what? Somebody coming to feedback better keep you're an eye on those so they don't take more. You're less than. Yeah, you're less than, yeah. or there's an assumption that you are where you are because you've done you you've oh, done something yeah, wrong, yeah. or yeah. there's yeah, and, sure. and, and 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 I think there's a real um, lack of awareness of privilege, right? That most of us have, and the people passing those judgments. And, and when you come here and you hear the situations of people, and and, and uh, what I say, you know, go back to our comment of there is no other, is that uh, I see it in our volunteers here the day they start they start seeing their grandmother and the senior that comes in. Mm. They see their mom and dad mm -hmm. and the parents mm -hmm. coming in there. Mm -hmm. they, they see their siblings and the kids running around playing here. Well, it changes games because they, cause they, they suddenly well, they get the realization that every one of us is three strikes away from being at a food bank. It's empathy, it roots it in the, I mean, I, I've often said for, you know, philanthropically for donors, if I could get them on the ground into Cambodia, the area where I like to work uh, the most in international development, it's going to change everything. Yeah. Take you by the hand. Let's sure. get in the low, the wooden boat. Let's cross the Mekong and go and visit the community that doesn't have access to clean water, yep. doesn't have a high school, et cetera. If it doesn't change your life in some way, hmm. there's, we, 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 we've got another conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm going to push you out of the boat on the way back. Well, and, and, and you know, that's that's <laughs> Cambodia. As simple as is here, we're in you know in suburban Mississauga, yeah, exactly. and, and someone says, "Well, how can I get involved? Where do you guys need help? What's really the problem?" I said, "Just come to the food bank. Just come, come here during a shift." Bank. So right now, I've given you a quick tour. This is a you know, pretty empty warehouse, right? Not much yeah. to look at, but during a shift, this place comes alive oh, because because yeah. we have the volunteers yeah. here, who are mostly young people coming here, and we have clients coming here, who are real people going through real tough situations, and we uh, we have to do something for them. So tell me, tell me the difference between uh, food insecurity and hunger, because there is a bit of a difference, isn't there? I mean, hunger is about just getting food on the table food insecurity is more about nutrition and sure. bigger bigger picture isn't it yeah i think i think they're 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 obviously on a spectrum and mm -hmm. one's a fancier term right uh, you know at the end of the day um, i think the easiest way to say it is you know when you're hungry and we've all been in that situation you know uh, when you're hungry you eat whatever's in front of you and it's about filling your belly right um, and that could be with junk food that could be with the chips the candy bar or it could be with the quinoa salad <laughs> depending on what's in front mm -hmm. of you mm -hmm. Food insecurity is, is now, I think, starting to say it's more systemic, and you're getting to a point now where over the course of your life, if you're a young person, uh, you're, you're, you're scrounging from kind of meal to meal, day to day, and you don't have a kind of a baseline of nutrition in your life. Like, you know, we, uh, most of us who are, come from you know, a privileged background, you know, I have a pretty solid breakfast at home. Uh, I, I, so that's my anchor, you know, a healthy breakfast. Lunch, I'm going to eat on the go. It's sometimes junk, but most of the time it's kind of the same. And then evening, you know, we have a pretty solid dinner. Most nights we cook at home and it's a kind of a diverse meal. Mm -hmm. And then we splurge every once in a while. But that kind of gives us an anchor of all that, right? Now, if you start taking those things away, I'm a kid. And, I, and when I wake up, there may be something to eat. Most likely there's not. Uh, I grab a candy bar or I grab the, the fake juice in the morning, whatever that's there. Lunchtime, whatever fast food place I can get. Evening, I come home. If my parents are working, whatever the situation is, I may not have dinner, maybe the pizza, maybe the yeah, sub. Sure. Or you know, sure. Those, all the things start adding up here. And I'm, I'm dealing with food insecurity in a, in a Western context. It's very different than your village in Cambodia. Yeah, of course. Um, but here, I think uh, you get into the food deserts, access to food, the cost of food, and then food literacy also comes into it as yeah, well. Yeah, sure. You know, you sure. think of many of the families that come to us. If you come, if you grew up in a house uh, that was not stable and you, you know, uh, take, get, learning about food is actually something most of us take for granted. You know, we had somebody in our lives that told us the difference between junk food and healthy food and that to eat enough vegetables to have a well-rounded meal. They taught us how to cook. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know, my mom, you know, I'm not a very good cook, but I can make for myself. And, and if I had to, I could scratch. But for a lot of people, they don't know. And, you know, we get uh, widowers coming in. You know, they, had, uh, they grew up in a you know, traditional house. They had their wives cooking, you know, doing the meals. Their, the wives have passed on now, and now they're in their 70s yeah. trying to fend for themselves. Yeah. And they're the folks coming in here, and all they ask for is frozen di dinners. Yep. And cans. Be beans and wieners. Beans and wieners, and they can make things yeah. do. So so for us, this is why the food bank world is really expanding, because if you start building teaching kitchens where yeah. you can start yeah. showing those folks community how gardens, to cook different meals, community. Well, community gardens are, you know, connection back to the food, increasing the supply of healthy food. But a lot of it is, you know, for us, uh, the concept we really deal with is how do we deal with the causes and the consequences of food insecurity? So the causes of food insecurity, what's going on in their life that's making them come to a food bank, not getting enough to eat? Is it health-related, employment-related, something around substance abuse, mental health, whatever it happens to be, there's a whole variety of reasons why people walk through the door. But because they're walking through the door and they're facing hunger and food insecurity, then they're going through a similar set of challenges. They're not getting the right food to eat, the nutrition, they're not able to take their medical conditions. Uh, if their kids aren't probably doing well in school, because if you're going to school hungry, 
you know, you're not concentrating. So both those need to be addressed. And I think the food uh, sector here in Canada, I think we're starting to get an awareness of it and start to deal with it. But we're still, you know, you still have 900,000 kids going to, uh, 900,000 people going to a food bank every month, every month in Canada. Yeah, no, the stats are crazy. It's, it, and I think what, what I love about uh, how you're unpacking this is it just shows you how interconnected all of these things are, Absolutely. the systemic nature of it, poverty, and uh, being at risk, whatever that means, yep. in whatever community you're in, whether it's uh, in the global south or the global north, because w let's face it, it it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a d different degree, different yep. context for sure, but deeply connected. The one affects the other, this Absolutely. notion of incremental change and little things. Um, tell me about your own change. So, so you had mentioned uh, offline that uh, the word sick comes from sickna, which is to learn, yeah. which I love. Tell me, six years ago, you said you wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. What the heck happened? So where did the conversion experience occur? So, so we've, you know, I've, I've grown up volunteering, and I you know, yeah. come from a family where it was always giving back. And uh, personally speaking, what happened about six years ago, you know, I worked for a major mining company flying around the world and got to do amazing work and great projects. You know, the company was going through transitions, and... Uh, I was looking for something different, and my wife, uh, you know, we're trying to start a family, and wife was at a big accounting firm, uh, working crazy hours, and the financial crisis has just happened, and things were just nutty, and and both of us just looked at each other and said, you know what, I think I think we want we don't want to live like this, mm. you know. And you know, I said to you, do you want to be a big partner at a big fancy firm? She was not really. She was, do you want to be an EVP of something something at some big firm of you know? And I said, not really. So we both took opportunities, was able to take a package, she left, and, and we basically have spent the last six, seven years re-engineering our lives. You know, we traveled around the world, started a family, but then we also looked at saying, you know, how do we, uh, how do we really, rather than waiting till we're 60 until we build that ideal life and then we get to, you know, how do we build a life in which we get to do all the things now? Uh, Timothy Ferris, the guy, that kind of the four hour work week guy, the guy that hacks everything, he had a great line. He goes, why don't you live as though you're retired? Because most of us are not going to be the retirement, you know, playing shuffleboard in Florida. Most of us are going to be, especially consultants, we're going to have jobs on the side, business Spare. on the side. The whole idea of retirement is being, talk about re-engineering. It's, it's totally re being rehacked. Right? And, and so, so for us, we kind of said, what kind of life do we want? And for me, I said, one in which I, I have a career, you know, obviously working, earning an income, paying off the mortgage and everything. But at the same time, uh, being able to commit at a, at a deeper level to causes that aren't just one off now. Mm. You know, I didn't want to just be, oh, I can I attend a board meeting six to nine on Monday nights. Right. I actually wanted something where during the day, during I could, it could make it an integral part of my life. You know, the food bank was a bit accidental, to be honest. Mm. We, um, we started out with a group of, uh, when we started Six Servant Canada, Six Servant Canada became before Save a Food Bank. They're kind of one and the same. But we were a group of young people that wanted to, we're a group of six, we wanted to serve, and we wanted to do all Canadians, and, and we didn't know what it was. We actually thought it was going to be a soup kitchen. Mm. So we started volunteering at soup kitchens. And we realized that soup kitchens are a whole different beast. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a management consultant, wife's an accountant, we have banker, lawyer, engineer, computer guy. The closest thing we had to social services was a nurse. Uh, we didn't know what the heck we were doing. <laughs> and so when you started volunteering at food banks, you realize, I mean, at a soup kitchen, you realize you're really dealing with the most marginalized, vulnerable people. And it, it can't just be part-time, and you got to have some underground. Aid. And we didn't have any money, we didn't have any experience. So we said, well, running a soup kitchen three times a day, you know, three meals a day, seven days a week, is just going to be too much. And we said, well, now what? We didn't know, so we started volunteering. We started volunteering Habitat for Humanity, helping with houses, did tree planting, did a whole variety, wherever, we were like a, 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 a volunteer squad. Wherever people needed help, we just started volunteering. <laughs> volunteer and, squad. And we'll, we called it the Save Us Squad, actually. Uh, and what we wanted to do was, uh, we knew we wanted a permanent space, because magic happens when you have physical spaces. And I'm a guy who did a lot of virtual work, but magic happens when you have four walls, you create the environment, and you have amazing pretty, people come together. Pretty interesting Cause, notion. Because great things happen in a space. Yeah, so we a, wanted a physical offline, space. Offline, I'd love to have a conversation great. with you. Physical space. Yeah. Second space is we wanted it to be one in which we were able to really engage with the community. Uh, like, uh, you know, uh, the Sikh community has, uh, like the Muslim community, a lot of faith groups here has has issues with really presenting its 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 authentic self. And, and if I... Uh, David, if I have to tell you I'm a gentleman, I'm probably not a gentleman. It's my actions that show if I'm a gentleman or not. Mm -hmm. So for the Sikh com community uh, to have a campaign, a PR campaign with great ads and billboards telling people how great we are, it wasn't going to change the move the needle. People's perceptions were going to change one positive personal interaction at a time. So we wanted an opportunity to do that. And the third thing we want to do is create a leadership factory. 
um, uh, a place where young people could hone their skills. Uh, within most of our emerging communities here, there isn't a lot of opportunities for people to, uh, young people to become leaders internally. So most of my leadership development came from university and other mainstream organizations. Right. And we needed an internal place to do that. So we started Six Serving Canada, looking around for different places, started volunteering at the Mississauga Food Bank which was shifting to a hub and spoke model where they were going to be the central kind of wholesaler and have a whole bunch of regional uh, spokes in each of the different parts of the city. And there was a part of town where they were looking for someone to set up shop. They didn't know who was going to be there. And we were volunteering there. They, uh, they were looking for somebody to do. We were looking for something to do. They were looking for someone to be here. And uh, lo and behold, that was end of 2009. And it took about a year to get this thing up and running. So they said to us, hey, have you ever, want to th ever thought of opening a food bank? And we said, not really. They're like, well, we can help you do it. it and so so that's how we ended up at a food bank. It sounded, well, it sounds very serendipitous on the surface. Absolutely. Level, but it sounds too, though, like you guys, all of you, you and your wife and the the The, 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 the cohort. The Save, <laughs> the Save a Squad. Yeah. Uh, we're listening. Capital L. We listen. We responded to the need, and since then, you know, the Sikh community is is so active around the world, and, and the mm -hmm. diaspora is so active and so well connected now. Um, you know, I, I, six. You know, it's it's funny. My my coworkers call it the Sikh Mafia because it doesn't matter what city I go to. There's there's one or two. You know, within a couple of posts on Facebook, there's a bunch of people I, can, I end up connecting with, and we've had people asking, saying, "Hey, we want to open up a food bank here. What do we need to do with you?" And my question always is, "Well, does your community actually need another food bank?" Yeah, exactly. Spend the time That's to good. understand the need. Uh, before you do anything, and I think for a lot of uh, cultural groups, because they, they, they're really struggling to integrate into the mainstream, and they see the value of, of creating an organization like this, but what we don't need is a parallel system. Right. We actually need them to be an integral component in this vast network of, of social services agencies. Well, it's, it's listening. I mean, I tell my students at Humber all the time that this idea of going into another community and saying, we've got the answers without really living how, or... How colonial listening. is that, right? Exactly yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And it's deeply troubling. Well, people have done it to... to you know, I'm South Asian. People have done it to us for centuries. And, and for us to go in and, yeah. and say, here's what we think you need. So even within the food bank here right now, you know, we give people food, but we say safe, nutritious, culturally appropriate, and personally acceptable. Yeah. And exactly. those last two things we really spend a lot of time on. Uh, because uh, you know, th it's, you know, we get a refugee from Syria and say, "By the way, here's your craft dinner and and, and you know whatever and, and to it," and they'd be like, well, "I don't know what to do with this." Yeah. So it has to be culturally appropriate, but it has to be personally acceptable too. I like uh, you know dark green dal. I don't really like yellow dal, even though both are culturally appropriate, right. but they're not right. personally acceptable See, I to like, me. I like black cherry pop shop pop. So. Okay. <laughs> there. <laughs> so personal acceptance. Culture. So personal acceptance is very important here. I got I got twelve bottles of Do pop you? shop pop for yeah. Father's Day, and it's yeah. like the greatest. It's heaven for you. Ever. Oh man, it's I unbelievable. Mean, Full of sugar, of course. Of course, of course. Speaking of, course. of you know health and nutrition. Well, we yeah. know there's, there's and we have snacks here too, of and people people kind of get know. mad at us, and and this and I and I said, you know what, you have to realize, um, this is one of my biggest learnings yeah. is how how isolating poverty ends mm -hmm. up becoming. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we've started doing is. Uh, uh, we stu started doing a lot more social events for our clients. Oh, that's neat. We did a movie night so last building, year. So you're building, you're building a community. We are, it's we are, because because yeah. for a lot of people, if you don't have money, just think about in your world. You know, David, not to put you on the spot, but all of a sudden, you know, your income goes to zero. Yep. And your friends are, you know, we're going to go out tonight, get some drinks, we'll watch a show, we're going to play, we're going to go up north up weekend. Can you come with us? You're going to, you know, you're going to be very yes. embarrassed. And one yeah. week, two weeks, and eventually, you're going to start retreating from that sure. circle because yeah. you can't live that lifestyle. You can't be part of it, and your friends are going to wonder why you're, you know. And so more and more, you're going to come in on yourself, and it becomes a downward spiral. Well, and I think, too, uh, Kalvir, it, it redefines poverty. And I think for me, this work, the teaching that I've done, the writing the work overseas, and even locally with, with uh, um, some groups in Oakville, where, where I live in North Oakville, to, it's redefined poverty for me. It's not just economic. No, not this at all. is about social. This is about relational. This is spiritual. This is emotional. This this operates on a lot of levels. Absolutely, because you meet people that, that it's a, it's a great point you make. Because uh, you know you meet people who don't have a lot of money, but they live an incredibly incredibly meaningful life. Yes. Maybe this is almost getting philosophical, right? You get yeah. people and because they're connected, they have a great sense of community. There's yep. interdependence yep. with their neighbors yep. and their loved ones, and individually they may not have much, but collectively. They take care of each other. And then at the same time, you meet people who have all the money in the world and they're incredibly isolated the and, and they got nothing. Ru Rupin Das, who used to be the director, a dear friend who used to be the director of the International Project Management Program at Humber College, uh, working in Papua New Guinea many years ago mm. in, in a community and being challenged by one of the village leaders. Who, who are you to tell me that I'm poor? 
And I'm telling you, I, I mean, I spent a year in postgraduate work in international development. That is one of the things that stuck with me more than sure. anything. Sure. You know, it's, and well, hang on a minute here. I don't define it the, same, the way you do. And we have a different well, sense of what is meaningful well, here, I, et cetera. It, the et little cetera. I've learned, been learning about First Nations, Aboriginal culture, right? It, everything was collectively owned. So mm. individual possessions were far and few between because yes, yeah. you didn't need them. But but if you had you gone to them and said, You're, you people are so poor because you don't have any stuff, they would look like you, like you have yeah, a, you know, yeah. like you have three heads because yes. their entire concept of, Poverty and wealth is not defined by materiality. That's right, yeah. It's defined yeah. by, you know, do you have enough? And and in those yeah, cases, yeah. they all have enough, right? The billionaire that's trying to make another billion yeah. is actually probably more poor because he needs another billion than the guy who makes thirty thousand dollars a year and is actually happy with thirty thousand dollars a year, right? You know, maybe maybe we need to redefine poverty as as you know, the poorest people are the ones that need the most, not the ones that Was you know, have the a, least. Was a conference uh, called Beyond GDP, uh, mm -hmm. talking about gross national happiness coming out of Bhutan. Sure. And we had the former Prime Minister of Bhutan there, Jigme Tinley, and so I learned a great deal about GNH mm. and all these other ideas mm -hmm. and ways of, of, of determining what growth is really all about, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, for a country, for mm -hmm. individuals, for families, and so on. And I think it's really quite remarkable. Yeah. Um, we're going to need to do a part two, uh, <laughs> for sure. Uh, tell me, uh, as we wrap up here, we haven't even talked about your consulting and your working in mining and so on. It's fascinating to me. What What's next for, for Seva? Uh, is there is there a third location in the in the works? Uh, what, what's the board talking about? Well, I think we're at a point now, to be honest, where uh, you know we're only five years old, and wow. uh, and and I and I, you know, I never got around to doing an MBA, uh, so this has been my uh, startup. Uh, I call it my startup experience nice. here. My my and and. and uh, most startups are not for profit by accident. This one's a not for profit by design, mm -hmm. uh, and and because we've learned, you know, how to create a business plan, how to launch, how to operate, how to grow very quickly, and then how to how to have huge growing pains. And I think what ended up happening here is that going from one location to two locations, and our second location is actually three times bigger. Wow. It's in Malton, and which is a very high need area. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know, David, if you have children, but I have two boys, and yes. I, me and my wife ha had this delusion that two kids were only going to be twice as much work. There's <laughs> bloody ten times as much work. I don't where, even, you know. Where did you go to school? I, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, my parents. I thought you were a bright guy. Yeah, yeah, that's what my parents think. Um, <laughs> and and so, you know, uh, uh, doubling the organization um, is actually tripling the organization. Yeah, you know, sure. doubling the number of locations. Sure, sure. And so we've been, uh, you know, really treading water over the last couple of years, mm. just because um, the complexity of everything changes, and it's, mm. it's been great learning. Around you know when you go from zero to one, that's really hard. It has a whole different set of challenges. But going from one to two, you can't just wing everything anymore. Now you start needing systems, processes, systems, sure. tools, because yeah. yeah. we have two different sets of everything going back and forth. Evaluation, monitoring, all volume, monitoring, monitoring, and then and then of course funding, right? You got to find it now. And and you know I think for most startups, uh, start not for profits, you know, raising a couple hundred thousand dollars a year is 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 a big deal, but it's still in order. It's still pretty simple compared to when you're having to raise half a million dollars a year. Because yeah. when you're at half a million, yeah. you got to bring in the science of fundraising, not just the art. Right. You can't just go yeah. around and ask your yeah. friends at the sure. end of the year, because you know we, we did that before. And uh, you can't just throw a big party and raise half a million. Right. Right. Uh, it needs a lot more systematization. And, and I think this is where the ideological part of me is that to mm. you know, develop the pragmatic side of right. me, is that right. at the end of the day, uh, it is the art of the possible. Mm. Uh, nice. uh, cash matters, cash flow matters, budgets matter. Uh, doing the right thing can be done in an extremely frugal way. Mm. Uh, so there's you know, necessities the mother invention, right? You know, we're here. Uh, uh, you know, we just uh, have a lot of summer students coming in this year because we were generous. Uh, the federal government had the great program, and we were lucky recipient of it. And uh, we have all these summer students with all these great ideas. And uh, I'm not popping their balloons saying, "Well, we don't have the money to do it." I actually. Told them up front, we don't have any money. So right. whatever ideas you're going to come up with, you're going to have to self-fund and do that. And and there was a part of me was like, thought the air was going to leave the room. Yeah, sure. And everybody, all these kids were like, okay, yeah, that's we're, fine. We're, and we're, now and that's start. just set a baseline. And now they're they're doing well, all these incredible things me, with the resources. To me, that's just an affirmation of, of what you're doing here and, and that it is moving forward. And obviously, there's struggles. And uh, I think it's a, a huge encouragement, though, not only to me personally, but to, I hope our listeners and also to the community. So. Thanks. And listen, part two, can we can we sort of tacitly agree that we're yeah. going to do a part two? Absolutely. Yeah. So savafoodbank.com. It's S-E-V-A foodbank.com. Check them out online. It's a great website. Culvier Gill here today with us. Thanks a lot for uh, joining us.